We are live and the audience is streaming in. Okay, this is really fast. We are already close to 75. I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna give it a couple of minutes for everyone to come in and do introductions. In the meanwhile, those of you who are already in this session, please let us know which city you are dialing in from. Let us know where in the country or where in the world you are attending this session from. That would give us an indication of where the audience is coming from. It's always interesting to see that. Okay, I okay. This is really fast. I see someone from Lucknow, Prayagraj, uh, Mumbai, Delhi, Hyderabad, Gurgaon, Mumbai, Khatko. Okay, someone is Khatko, but okay. Uh, all right. Quite a few people from Delhi. I see Aurangabad. I see Krutarth is from Mumbai. Bani again is from Mumbai. Himanshu is dialing in from Delhi. All right. So the audience is streaming in. We have close to two thousand registrations for today's session. So I'm expecting, and the room capacity is 1,000. So I'm expecting we'll reach that number very soon. We are already close to 300 now. I'm still gonna wait for the audience to come in before I do proper introductions. In the meanwhile, those of you who are already in this room, please let us know which city in India are you dialing it from? All right. I see Karthik from Nami Mumbai, Sagarika is from Bombay. Okay, Apurva from Chennai, welcome there, okay. Great, so the audience is quite literally from across the world, across the country, sorry. And hopefully I, you know, in, a, in the last couple of sessions, we had a few people dialing in from outside of India as well. Hopefully some of them are in this particular session as well. So if anyone who's dialing, dialing from outside of India, please let us know which country or which city you're dialing in from. It's always good to see where the audience is coming from. All right, Naveen from Hyderabad. All right, so I think uh, we have a fair number of people who are already in and the audience is still streaming in. So we are close to 400 people in the room right now. So let me get started uh, without any further ado and without any further delay. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session. Thank you for dialing in on time. My name is Sanjay Dhingra. I'm one of the co-founders at Seed Global Education Limited. We are the hosts of this particular session. And it's an honor and pleasure to be hosting BitSOM for this particular session. Today's session is going to be extremely interesting, extremely exciting, and something that I have been looking forward to since the last couple of weeks, since we finalized the whole concept of the session. We are going to be hearing from two very interesting speakers. We are going to be hearing from Narutam Kishore, who is the head of admissions and outreach at BITSOM. That's the BIT School of Management, which has come up in Mumbai, something which is really emerging and becoming really popular over the last couple of years. We are also going to hear from author Devdat Patnak, he needs no introduction. I'm pretty sure a lot of you in the audience have already heard of him, uh, read his books, and you know, he's a celebrity and a star in himself. He's an author of many, many books. He's very well recognized. And uh, he's, by the way, also a visiting faculty at Bitsome. So this is going to be a really, really interesting session that we are gonna do with the two of them today. To kickstart today's session, and to you know, uh, give you more insights, firstly into the school before we hear from uh, Mr. Devdat Patnag. I'm going to invite Narutam Kishore, as I said, who's the head of admissions and outreach at Bitsom. He's also an alumnus of SRCC. He's an alumnus of ISB Hyderabad. That's where he and I met. We used to work together at ISB in the admissions department. So I'm going to invite him to talk to you for the first 10 minutes, give you an insight into the school, into the program, and the highlights of the Bitsom school. It's really popular, as I said and something emerging. So I'm gonna invite him to talk to you for the first 10 minutes, give you an insight into that. Before we move to Mr. Devdat Patnayak and hear from him about the beyond, about beyond the ward, wardroom culture, right? Reimagining work and life and how to handle conflicts and situations at the workplace and make it a more productive workplace. So we are gonna hear from both of them, but let us first start with Narutam to hear more about Bitsom. Over to you, Narutam. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, before I start, I just want to share my screen and then we will begin. All right, good evening, everyone. I'll take 10 minutes to introduce you about Bitsong. Bitsong is a new B school that has come up uh, in Mumbai, and I will be giving you a brief introduction about this school, and then we will uh, be taking on uh, the session with um, the data for now. So it's a new B-School that has come up uh, in Mumbai. Uh, it's a B-School promoted by Bits Pilani. Now there was an MBA program offered at Bits Pilani in Pilani campus, but this is a different MBA program and a different business school. So it is a Bits School of Management. 
and you get a degree from MBA uh, of MBA from Wits Pilani. So the degree that you get is MBA from Wits Pilani. Uh, so you have that brand, this top notch brand of Wits Pilani. So that's something a lot of people aspire to get. So uh, so that's that's a degree that you get from with some MBA. The location is in Mumbai. Uh, the uh, the program is offered in Mumbai. So it's a two year residential program where you you are given a combination, you're part of this city and that's where the program is offered. So the location in Mumbai, it's a two year MBA program. That's a brief uh, uh, brief intro about Bitsom MBA. You can visit our website and know more about this program. But this is, I can tell you, this is one of the most exciting school that is coming up in recent future. I mean, I mean, in the recent future, you see a lot of new B schools are coming up, but I can assure you, this is one of the most exciting ones that is there. And the reason why it is so exciting because I'm going to share a few of the key things that we are offering that we, you may find it that one of this is of course coming out one of the most promising e school in the near future. So to start with the faculty that we are bringing, we are bringing faculty uh, from top notch e schools across the world. In addition to Mr. Devdutt Patnaik, he is also teaching at Bitsom and he will be giving you a glimpse of the course that he teaches at Bitsom. Uh, you also have faculty from top class business schools across the world. So you have faculty from Wharton Business School, you have faculty from Kellogg School of Management, faculty from NYU Stern, Singapore Management University. And these faculty will be coming and teaching you on one particular course. So they will be coming and teaching one particular course. So for example, Mark Finn will be teaching accountancy. Uh, uh, then Anjay will be teaching uh, corporate finance. Similarly, uh, Louis Martin, he teaches organizational behavior courses. So the, so the learning that you have is a typical top class learning because these faculty come from uh, top class B schools across the world and they will come in Mumbai and teach you in a classroom setting. So that's something we, we find it very exciting, and that's how Bitsom, we, we are very much excited about this new school that is coming up, that is already there now. Here are a few more examples of other faculty. Uh, we have Professor Samit Rodatta, he was recently uh, elected as a Dean of Site Business School, and he will also be teaching at Bitsom, so that's another exciting thing that we are very much uh, happy about. Uh, dean is Dr. Ranjan Banerjee, uh, he is an ex-Dean of SPJMR, now he is a Dean of Bitsom, and he will also be teaching one of the course at Bitsom. So again, the key thing that I want to emphasize about the faculty who would be teaching at Bitsom and the kind of learning that you're getting is this top class uh, B-School learning because most of these faculty teach in the top class B-School B -school of class one and they will be coming and teaching in a classroom set. So that's one thing uh, Bitsom offers, which gives it one of, uh, one of the most exciting programs in, uh, in, among the new B-School that has come up. Another thing that I want to talk about is our curriculum. Now curriculum, uh, of course, in the first year, we offer those four courses. In the second year, we have these five specializations. So first is entrepreneurship, second is finance, third is e-commerce and digital strategy, fourth is leadership and strategy and fifth is marketing. Now, the unique thing about this uh, curriculum is that since we are a new B-School, we are able to design a curriculum which is aligned with what industry needs. Uh, and that's that's something we are very much proud of because uh, the kind of faculty we are bringing, the kind of curriculum that we are bringing, we are very much confident that we will be able to offer top class learning and people and students who graduate from this program, they will be able to uh, contribute to the organization right from the day one once they graduate, graduate from this program. So it's exciting curriculum, exciting specializations, and that's something you want to look up to when you want to pursue your MBA from any of these schools across the world. The third thing that I want to talk about is uh, our collaboration with London Business School. So as a part of this collaboration, we are offering two weeks of international immersion. Uh, in uh, in your second year. So once you become a part of it, some MBA class in your second year, you have this opportunity to go to London Business School and spend two weeks over there. So in, during those two weeks, you will be uh, studying uh, under the LBS faculty. You will be interacting with the LBS uh, students. You will be visiting London and visiting few you know, companies, few entrepreneurs, and have some one-on-one -on -one session with the faculty of LBS. So that's another uh, an exciting aspect that you want to consider. You get that global experience, global knowledge, uh, by participating in this international version, which is offered to a second year MBA students of uh, Bitsom once they uh, become part of this MBA program. The third thing, uh, fourth thing is, is the placements. Uh, that's another aspect we are putting a lot of emphasis on. Uh, so recently, we finished our summer internships and the companies that participated for the founding class is, uh, these are some of the companies that participated. We have companies from consulting companies, we have Bain and Company, Arthur De Little, Carney, uh, and again, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, EY, those, those, those are the companies that listed uh, for our summer internships. From FMCG, we have HUL and Nestle, they participated in our summer internship. From banking also, we have the bank, uh, banks like ICICI Bank, Nexus Bank, and so on. Uh, so considering this is our first year, uh, 
we are very much proud of the fact that we are able to bring some top-notch companies and we are able to offer uh, summer internship to our founding class. And recently we finished our summer, our summer internship season and we are able to offer 100% summer internship placements to our founding class students. Uh, uh, the school will be going on internship in the month of April this year. The campus is in Pawai. These are a few pictures of the campus. So we invite you to, if you're in Mumbai, we encourage you to come to come and visit us in a, in a Pawai campus. That's where the campus is Hiran Nandani Knowledge Park. That's where, I can, that's where our campus is. And uh, yeah, we would love to show you the campus. So if you are, if you are in Mumbai, we would uh, invite you to come and visit us and we'll be able to see the infrastructure that we provide to our students, uh, of India students. So here's a few picture of our founding class. Uh, we, uh, students are in Mumbai, they are attending classes. Uh, right now the classes are in uh, online sessions, but uh, last month we have this classes in a physical setting where faculty were coming from different B schools and they, will be te they were teaching in a, a classroom setting. So this is one of the picture of uh, a, a class uh, which attended uh, uh, a few months back. Now, what is the overview of founding class? Uh, we have 139 students uh, in the founding class and the average CAT was 94, the average GMAT was 680, the average GRE was 316. We have students from top Indian institutions like IIT Madras, IIT Dhuki, from Pitspilani, NMIMS, and so on. Even, even we have students from global institutions like University of Warwick or NYU University, uh, Penn State University, and so on. Similarly, in our uh, men-women ratio, we have very much proud of the fact that we are able to get you know, 65 or 35 percent ratio between men and women in a founding class. So that's something we are very much proud of. And that gives a lot of confidence that we would be able to get a top-notch class in the second year also. So it's a kind of fear that we're able to have for this founding class. Uh, they are top-notch students. They, they are offering a lot of uh, uh, learning to their peers by being part of this founding class. In terms of our work experience, uh, we have 50% of the class coming from zero to two years of work experience. We have uh, then 33% of the class with work, work experience two to four years and so on. Similarly, uh, majority of the students in the classroom are in the age range of 22 to 25 years of work, 25 years of age. That's another glimpse that you want to take note of if you decide to uh, plan your MBA going forward. So what is the application requirement? What is it that you need to, uh, you, what you need to do to be eligible to apply to BITSOM MBA program? So first is you need to have a bachelor's degree. And even if you're in the final year of your uh, undergrad program, you are eligible to apply to BITSOM MBA program. So that's the first criteria. Second criteria, you should have taken CAT test in 2021. That's the first criteria. And second, or you should have taken GMAT or GRE test in the last five years. So if you, Fulfill these two criteria. Uh, if you are a final year student, if you are a uh, if you have a bachelor's degree, and if you have taken a test in, uh, in 2021, CAT test in 2021, or if you have taken GMAT or GRE in the last five years, you are, you are eligible to apply to this with some MBA program. In terms of our evaluation, we look at academics, we look at uh, your aptitude test score of CAT, GMAT, or GRE, we look at your extracurriculars, we look at your essays, we ask uh, applicants to write essay on two different topics. We look at your work experience. Work experience is not that mandatory, but uh, uh, if, you, if you have work experience, you get such advantages to that. And then we also look at your letter of recommendation, one reference, and that's something that also we have to we give a lot of emphasis on. So these are the six components that go into the application. And if you put your best foot forward, you have a strong chance of getting a shortlist for the interview as well as getting an option. Uh, we have this funding, uh, we have the scholarship also. So we, uh, we offer three kinds of scholarships. One is merit scholarship, second is need come merit scholarship, and third is women's scholarship. So we have a good amount of budget allocated to those scholarships. So uh, if you have the need for the finance, we will be uh, offering a scholarship and through that you can uh, get admission into this program. Our admission to the class, which will start in July 2022, that has already started. We opened the admission cycle in the month of September. In our round two, currently our round two admission cycle is open, and the deadline is 30th of January 2022. Uh, and then uh, we, once you submit your application, we evaluate your application basis that we offer admission offer in the month of February to March, and the class begins in, on 4th of July 2022. Then we expect you to be in Mumbai and attend the class in the classroom setting. So that's in brief about Bitsom. I hope uh, if you need to if you need to know more about this program, I encourage you to visit our website bitsom.edu.in. That's where you can go and visit uh, know more about this program. 
if you want to connect with us, you can uh, reach out to this contact number and one of our counselors will be taking your call and they will be asked any queries that you have. So these are contact details. Uh, I would encourage you to reach out to us. And if you have any queries, feel free reaching out to us and we will be happy to provide you more information about this program. So with that, I conclude my presentation. I'll hand it over back to Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay, over to you now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Narutam. Thanks for those insights. Uh, just give me one second to just take care of the adjustments. All right. Thanks, Narutam. Thank you for this very insightful session. Uh, by the way, to the audience, a lot of the faculty that Narutam mentioned actually taught us as well, taught him and me as well when we were students at ISV. And some of them are stalwarts in their domain. In fact, all of them are stalwarts in their domain. Uh, Mr. Piyush Kumar, uh, Mark Finn, uh, Shamika Ravi, Mudit Kapoor. These are loved so much at ISV. It's unbelievable. They are really, really great at what they do. At this point, we do have a number of questions which have come in regarding admissions to the school. Uh, we have Sampurna from the Bitsom team who's already responding to those messages through the chat. You know, she's typing out the responses. So if you have some common queries, you can see those in the answered tab. But at this point, I don't want to make keep the audience waiting to hear from Mr. Devdat Patnayak. So I'm going to invite him to join us now. Uh, Devdat, it would be great if you could go live as well. Awesome. So great. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be hosting you today, as I uh, mentioned earlier. To the audience, I'm sure, as I mentioned, all of you already know him. Many of you would have read his books as well. But I'm still going to take a moment to introduce him. It's my pleasure to be doing that. So Devdat Patak is an author. He's a mythologist. He's a belief leadership and a culture consultant. He writes on the relevance of Indian and world mythology in modern times. He was trained in medicine. He worked in the domain of healthcare and pharma for the first 15 years of his career before he decided to plunge full time into his passion, which is writing. Over the course of his you know, writing career of the last many years, he's published over 50 books, conducted over 500 workshops, has over 1000 columns written in uh, media across India and across the world. And he's also done over 3000 illustrations, not to mention He's written content and script for popular TV shows like Devlok and Business Sutra as well. He's literally, or he can be credited or in making Indian culture accessible to the next generation. Believe me, before I read his books, I didn't know, I hardly knew anything about the Indian culture and the Indian mythology. And his books have been my stepping stone into understanding more about the Indian mythology. And believe me, if you haven't read any of his books so far, you should, should surely do this. It gives you a great perspective on the Indian mythology and divergent views on the same stories that you would have read or heard about from your grandparents or parents in the past. As I mentioned, he's also a visiting faculty at Bitsom, teaches a very interesting course on culture over there. So I'm going to invite him to talk to us for the next 40, 45 minutes, give us a sample of his teaching at Bitsom, and then we are going to take more questions for him and for Narutha Matt as well. What do you, Devdar? Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Um, so for those who don't know me, my name is Devdat Patnaik. I write uh, on mythology and its application in modern times. Uh, before I begin, let me tell you something about myself. So I was trained in medicine. So I am a graduate from Grand Medical College, Mumbai. And after my uh, MBBS, I decided to work in the pharma and healthcare industry. And I worked there for 15 years in various capacities, uh, in uh, training, in marketing, in sales, in Salesforce effectiveness. And all this time, I had absolutely no knowledge of MBA. I was not, I've not done an MBA, but I was learning on the job, on the ground. And um, I was a quick learner. I, I understood how business is done. I, uh, my last role in the pharma industry was as a business unit head. Um, and during this time, I realized uh, I was working with Germans, French, American people. And in the course of working with people from around the world, I realized uh, there was a cultural dissonance in the way we worked. And they did not understand us. We didn't understand them. Um, we were trying to negotiate with each other in different ways. And I realized culture plays a very important role in global business. Now, in my free time, I 
the mythology. And that was just something that I did as a hobby. But because of this engagement with people from around the world, I started finding solutions to day-to-day -day problems that I encountered in the business space through Indian mythology, which I would share in with my friends and then gradually became a column in Economic Times. And this column has been going on for the last uh, 10 years, more than 10 years, I have been writing this column because more and more people were interested in understanding an Indian approach to management. Because I said, I mean, uh, when you start studying these subjects, you realize management as it is taught around the world, where does it come from? Who invented these subjects? Where does it come from? And these are questions that you have to ask. And before we get into that, um, I want to check how much, what's the IQ level of this group? So I'm going to ask you to give me the full form of these two words. These are two words which are commonly now used in academic circles, especially in management circles. I want to check how many of you all understand these two words. And what is the delta between these two words? I'd like to see the answers in the chat box. Let me see what comes across. That will be a simple way to understand how do I look at this audience. OK, this, so what's the A? Excellent. I can see quite a few answers. Yes, that's so true. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Arts is the new thing. And that's the big game changer today. Now, let me explain you why. This arts is a game changer. And I, the reasons are very complex. Before that, let's give a practical example. One of the things that we have observed, uh, one of the things that we have observed now, major tech companies around the world are inviting Indians to become their leaders. Is it an accident? Because it's a pattern that is emerging. You're finding it in Microsoft. You're finding this in uh, re recently in Twitter. You're finding this sudden rise in people in extreme in Google, in IBM, you suddenly find a whole bunch of Indians in very senior positions. The question to ask here is they are as qualified as everybody else around them. They are equally qualified where STEM is concerned. Where STEM is concerned, their knowledge of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, finance, business is perhaps at that level it's equal. What is the key differentiator that made these guys suddenly rise up? People in the interviews, what is it that people found that said, this one will lead our company, this one will lead our company? And it was clearly something soft. It was their culture. All of them were born and raised and their early education happens in India. And they have learned certain skills, which is very abstract. We don't know what these skills are, but they clearly bring that to the table and which is enabling them to take leadership positions around the world. It has been articulated. If you read Vivek Vadva's articles on this, he's written extensively on this in Fortune magazine, if I'm not mistaken, he says, the culture they enter is a masculine, toxic culture, which is competitive, combative, and conflict driven. They are entering an ecosystem which is masculine, toxic, combative, competitive. And what are they bringing to the table? They are bringing a collaborative energy, a empathy. They are not alphas. They are listening to people. They're talking to people. They are getting people together. Now, how do you learn that? You cannot learn that in STEM. And you can't always rely on intuition that name osmosis se aajayega. Can we turn certain abstract things into concrete frameworks that enables us to get the best out of us as Indians? Do we know who we are? And that's the question you have to ask yourself. Science will not make you understand 
and India, not technology, not engineering, not mathematics. These are universal subjects. They're transcendental. They are universal. It doesn't matter where you study them. You can be good anywhere in the world. But arts is something different. It forces you to recognize humans as part of culture. It makes you think about people. You start appreciating China, Japan, Australia, Europeans, Koreans. You'll be working with people from all over the world. How do you work with them? How do you become the next CEO who is able to get things along? And people say, you know what? These Indians are able to do something that nobody else is able to do. And I call this ahimsa management. Now, ahimsa management, when you think of ahimsa, you initially think of Gandhi. But this is not ahimsa management of Gandhi. Ahimsa is a word that first appears in the Rig Veda. It first, the first time the word appears is in the Rig Veda. And it is amplified in Jain and Buddhist stories. So Jains and the Buddhists, now look at the Jain community. The Jain community is one of the most successful business community in India. It contributes to a major part of the GDP. Not today, but for hundreds and hundreds of years, they have been traders and businessmen respected all over the world. But do you know their stories? Do you know their business wisdom? Is it taught in Harvard? Does anyone teach you the wisdom of Jain businessmen? Nobody teaches you the business, the, uh, the wisdom of the Jain businessmen. The Buddhist merchants controlled the cotton trade, the silk routes, the spice routes. That is why if you go along the silk routes, along the cotton routes, along the spice routes, you will find gigantic Buddhist monuments. They were merchants. When we talk of Buddhism, we are only talk of Buddha Shananga Chami. We are talked about monastic orders. Nobody tells us about this mercantile tradition of the Buddhists. So why is nobody telling you about those merchant traditions? We have heard that India was called the Sone Ki Chidiya, the land of the golden sparrow. It was the word, word given by the Romans because they used to import luxury goods from India. And gold used to flow out of Rome into India in the Gupta period. So India was called the land of the golden bird, which means we were very good at business. Now, where is that business knowledge? And Indians were not known for violence. The main theme in Buddhism, Jainism is Ahimsa. In the Rig Veda, it's Ahimsa. So it's not violence. It is not about competing and combating and dog eat dog world it is not about rat race these words don't exist so how did they make money they made lots and lots and lots of money without violence and that's the question to ask the world teaches us that in order to be successful you have to be violent that is how we are taught think big be ambitious but nobody talks about, hey, how do we create a world that is not just prosperous, but also happy? Can I be happy making a lot of money? Because most rich and powerful people I meet don't seem happy. Why aren't they happy? Why aren't they joyful? Why when you look at their face, you don't feel, oh, they are so happy. They look so stressed. They look so angry. They look, they're toxic. They create toxic work systems. And that's not necessary. Money making can be a lot of fun. So in the Indian traditions, it is said that there is lab, which is profit, and there is shubha lab, which is auspicious profit. So if you are from a traditional business family, you would have in Diwali written the word shubh lab. What is shubh lab? How is it different from lab? Lab, profit is profit, right? And what is shubh lab? Have you ever asked this question? Why do we not ask this question? It is because we do not pay attention. We don't respect our past. We don't respect our traditions. We don't believe that the Jain businessman, the Marwadi businessman, the Baniyas, they created knowledge that could create lots of prosperity without violence. Without violence. So, Shubha Lab ka matlab kya hai? Shubh Lab. 
So I'll explain it to you. In, in lab, Lakshmi is grabbed. You grab wealth from the customer. In Shubha lab, you make Lakshmi walk towards you voluntarily. You have to give and to receive. So these ideas are there in Indian traditions. They go, Lakshmi apne aap ghar mein aani chahi. She should come of her own free will. Why would she come of your own free will? It will only come when you give goods and services to the market that the market loves so much that in exchange they give you gold. And the, the more goods and services you give the market, the more gold will walk your way. And that's how Lakshmi keeps walking your way. Shubhalab, you don't have to chor banni ki koi avashakta nahi. You don't have to steal from people. You don't have to raid them. You don't have to exploit them. You give customer delight and money comes to you. So customer, so ranabhumi nahi, rangabhumi kaya. So ranabhumi or rangabhumi. Ranabhumi is war room. Let's fight. Let's, you know, all those wolf of, what is it? Wolf of Wall Street. Crazy people. Destroying the world. Destroying cultures. Destroying society. Destroying nature. To make money. Well, Indians are saying, rangabhumi karo. You know, let's do rangabhumi. Let's have fun. Rangashala, theater. Now look at the difference between Ranabhumi and Rangashala. In a Ranabhumi, you fight and you defeat someone and you take their money. So you steal. Chori karte ho. And we are saying, wow, I'm a great warrior. Everybody wants to be a warrior and kill people to make money. Lakshmi. To wo ho gaya? Lab. I'm profit. To tumne ka nirman kar diya. Jahan pe bhot hai, khazana hai. But nark ka bhi nirman kar diya. Because people who have suffered for because of you are not going to leave you alone. वो लोग तो रिवेंज लेने आएंगे जरूर आएंगे कर्म तो होगा ही होगा और फिर रंग भूमि स्टेज थिएटर लुक एट व्हाट हैपेंस इन द थिएटर यू परफॉर्म वेरी वेल इन द थिएटर एंड द ऑडियंस सेज वाह वाह बहुत अच्छा है एंड दे से बहुत वेरी वेरी गुड आई लव द शो दे गिव यू मनी देन दे वांट टू हैव अ रिपीट कि अरे बहुत अच्छा किया मैं वापस आके देखूंगा ये शो इट्स कॉल्ड रिपीट ऑर्डर इन बिजनेस and then you'll tell your friends and relatives go and watch the show bahut acha hai that is called referral which means when you perform well in the rangabhumi you have repeat order and you have you have repeat order and you have referrals and that's how lakshmi walks your way you just have to perform beautifully you have to delight the customers in the rangabhumi no need of ranabhumi ranabhumi management is what is taught in the west and they create toxic masculinity it is a crazy world it's a foolish world it will not take you anywhere you'll get a heart attack and die and then you wonder what will you happen to your money you will spend half your life gaining weight falling ill your wife will not love you recently um uh, in uh, you know in one of his interviews um the head of google made this comment i think alphabet he made this comment that you know we are juggling balls of work and life work and life work and life and the thing is the work ball is made of rubber but your life ball is made of glass when you your work ball can bounce back but your life ball once broken will not bounce back you need to make a lot of money yes but joyfully lakshmi should come so don't try to create swarg you can create vaikunt where lakshmi comes of her own free will joyfully now these ideas look at the words i'm using swarg vaikunt these are indian words these are found in jain traditions these are found in buddhist traditions swarg nark is found in buddhist traditions there is they don't use the word vaikunt in jainism they use the word siddhalok they use different words but they are talking about profit and loss and debt rin they are talking about in financial term terminology they talk financial ter terminologies all the time the entire model i'll give you an example uh in india god is not a judge the concept of god as judge does not exist in jainism buddhism hinduism god is a judge is an idea which comes from middle eastern traditions so in india they said well, what is god then god they said god is an accountant bahi khata he maintains accounts 
He remembers everything that you have done. All the debt has to be repaid. And that's what happens. We have to, we have to figure out. Now, as students, don't make up your mind. You have to open your mind. Don't think you know it all. You have to learn. You have to learn the stories from the Jain traditions, the Buddhist traditions, the Hindu traditions. Ask yourself why the banyan tree is called the banyan tree. You know, it's named after the banyas used to gather under the tree to reconcile their account books after trading the whole day in the market. That's how the banyan tree came to be known as the banyan tree. It was named after the banyas. Or think about this story. Um, you know, there is a story from the Buddhist tradition of Bindumati. Bindumati. So Bindumati was a courtesan, Ganikati. She used to dance and sing. And one day they say that, uh, the story is from the Milinda Panna. It is a Buddhist text. And they say that one day the Ganga started flowing Ulta in the northern direction. And King Ashoka was wondering, how can the Ganga flow in the northern direction? Ulti Ganga kaise bai sakti hai? So the people, his, all the priests tell her that all the things that happen, that you have to find out there is somebody in your kingdom with a lot of integrity. Someone has so much integrity and integrity in Sanskrit is called Sat, Sat ki Shakti. So much of integrity that that person has caused the Ganga to flow in the reverse directions. So he goes, Ashoka goes around the kingdom finding the person with integrity and finally he's taken to the house of a courtesan, a dancer called Bindumati. Now Bindumati is got, has come, there is Bindumati. She tells that, yes, I have integrity and I am the one who has made the Ganga flow ulta. So how did you, what is this, where did you get this integrity from? And she said, very simple. I am a singer and a dancer. Anybody who pays me my fair fee, I sing and dance for them. I don't care whether they are Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra. I don't care what job they do. I don't care who they are. If they pay me my fee, I treat them as an equal customer and give them the services that they demand. So, uncha, nicha, jo bhi ho, agar usne mere, mujhe mera fee pay kiya hai, if he's paid the fee, I will give the full service. I don't discriminate between my customers. This is why I have Sat and that is why I can cause the reverse flow of Ganga. Now, you know what is the meaning of the reverse flow of Ganga? Reverse flow of Ganga doesn't actually mean the Ganga was flowing Ulta. I don't think people were so foolish to think about it. You see, when you have money, what is the natural flow of money? You spend money, right? All your money goes, you have expenses and your income gradually through expenses, your savings dissipate. This is the normal flow of Ganga. But what is Ulti Ganga? When the money that flows out comes back, it is called financial management. It's called financial management. When your money is not in expense, in expenses, but invested so that it gets returns and therefore your treasury gets money back. That's called Ulti Ganga in, in the folk traditions. That is the meaning of Ulti Ganga. The courtesans were famous the, um, the courtesans were very famous for doing something called Amarakosh, immortal treasures, also known as Akshayadan. You know what it means? It means they would give money to a temple or a monastery and say that you can use this as capital, but use only the interest to you for your operational expenses, which means the wealth is permanent. It's a permanent endowment. Now, these ideas were developed in India over 2000 years ago by courtesans, by merchants. But we are not taught this in business schools. This idea that wealth can generate wealth, Amarakosha, Akshaydana. And this is what I feel students need to learn. Because then you will be proud of your country. You'll be proud of your heritage. You will go internationally. And when you're talking to Chinese people, you will talk as an equal. When you talk to Europeans and Americans, you will say, I come from a country with a rich business heritage. And we don't believe that to make money, we have to make war. We can make money without fighting, without arguing. We can find a way to make Ganga flow in the reverse direction. So that you become rich and I become rich and we both become rich. 
how do we figure out a way so that everyone benefits and no one suffers baat karne se hi hoti hai isko sanskrit mein samvad kehte hain vivad nahi samvad and that is what these ceos whether it's satya nadella whether it is indra noi whether it is pankaj agarwal what are these guys bringing to the table they are bringing samvad not vivad not fighting not combat not war room strategies they are saying without saying it they're not using the word i am using the word i am sa management because we are in this world to make the world prosperous we are not here in this world to fight with people we are here in this world to bring prosperity to people you exist to make money for yourself and those around you you don't exist to make life miserable for people around you don't believe this nonsense that only if you are toxic will you be successful that is a foolish idea ki main ladai karke logo ko torture karke main paise banaunga ye sab hindi film mein chalta hai it's a foolish thing because you will be unhappy be bindumati be the banyas who figure out i'll tell you a story from the agarwal community the agarwal community has a beautiful story about how they created a ecosystem of entrepreneurship the agarwals would uh, uh, the king agrasen would say that i want talented people he was the merchant king he said i want talented people to work come into my kingdom so he would invite talented people who didn't have capital let's say you know come to my kingdom and he would tell everybody in his kingdom to give this talented person two things one brick and one gold coin so everybody in the village would give this man one brick and one gold coin with the bricks the man could build a house with the gold coin he had capital to start business if he was successful he owed his success to the community and therefore contributed to the community and therefore he created an ecosystem of investment so these are stories which our country has which we don't talk about which we don't celebrate we only talk about chandragupta and chanakya and war and fighting i would rather far focus on making money lakshmi and the story is of lakshmi and how she comes and where she goes and what she does why does she prefer the rangabhumi over the ranabhumi these are the conversations that i would like you to have these are the conversations that i would like you to consider and that is how that is the difference when you focus on the arts because it will help you think about life you see arts helps you think about life it will help you think about psychology about philosophy about uh, what is it that people want about empathy about design what is it about apple's design that makes it so successful why uh, what is the design interface what is the magic of a great design interface so this is what we are talking about design how do how is design playing an important role in business how is uh, literature copywriting plays an important role look at uh, steve jobs look at the advertising of absolute vodka or look at the advertising of apple or see the advertising of tesla the sophistication of that ad. the the use of line the use of photography they understand color they understand design they understand how it shapes human behavior you have to understand the arts you have to understand literature you have to understand architecture you have to understand if you don't understand this is not taught in stem science technology engineering and maths do not teach you this they do not teach you about human insecurities office politics how do you handle office politics how do you manage bosses how do you manipulate bosses how do you deal with difficult bosses how do you work with people how do you manage conflict how do you make people work with you how do you reduce hostility how do you deal with pride and arrogance how do you develop patience all these things are not taught in science technology engineering mathematics but are critical for business success how do you make a fabulous presentation that gets the investor interested you need good communication skills you need, and to have good communication skills you have to understand what people see you may want to say many things but they don't want to hear that 
what is the art of seduction to learn the art of seduction you have to know how the courtesans functions the ganikas the apsaras bindumatis magic by which she could get customers that is how marketing starts that is how sales happens how do you enchant people how do you become a mohini how do you get business to come your way do you chase profit like a tiger which chases the deer or do you behave like a flower that produces fragrance and gets the bees and butterfly towards it so many different styles of management exist and these are all part of indian tradition it you don't have to go to harvard for that you just have to dip into india's rich past understand how why we celebrated today people talk about lakshmi but it's not just lakshmi you have to talk about you should also talk about power durga and knowledge saraswati patents saraswati so you have to talk about knowledge you have to talk about power law how is power used how is power negotiated so you have to understand durga and you have to understand lakshmi of course so all three things become important so business is not just about learning technology and learning tasks and how to fill an excel sheet it is also about managing power about managing resources about managing knowledge you know across industry people are saying you know as certainly somebody was telling me oh there is a talent crisis there is a talent crisis and that's a lie there is no talent crisis every company has so much politics that they get rid of talented people because talented people can't stand other talented people they're all fighting they're all in a war room and therefore companies lose talented people because other talented people in the company want to mark their territory like alpha beasts they create a war room ecosystem and wonder why nobody is collaborating so there is no talent crisis there is an ego crisis and that is the problem but nobody teaches you how to manage the ego and that's what uh, we study culture for we study mythology for and that's what i will be teaching you over uh, in my sessions that's at least what i do i focus on mythology so that you get a perspective a little more wider perspective of business and uh, maybe it will help you make more money and maybe you will be the next ceo of a next conglomerate or the owner of the next conglomerate in the world you never know thank you very much namaste thanks devdar thank you for this extremely insightful session we do have questions which have come in from the audience in fact some comments coming in saying okay so okay, quite a few comments coming in so riya is saying very very insightful i read someone saying that he was completely blown away by the session and you can see the comments in the chat and the audience has been very receptive very insightful i am going to take some questions from the audience they are already in the q and a box so i'm going to pick up a few select ones to ask you so i'm going to take the first question from utkarsh bharadwaj who's saying that bhagavad gita has already been incorporated in the mba curriculum these days there are some schools taking learnings from the gita bringing them into the classroom as well so his question is according to you what are the specific areas or what can we learn from the gita and how do you map the adhyayas to the current business management scenarios you see we must be careful when people start turning the bhagavad gita into a motivational speech to make money be very careful about it the bhagavad gita is a spiritual document at the end of the mahabharat war arjun loses all his children he wins the battle and loses his children so in the bhagavad gita it is told that you can focus on your work and you may lose your life you will have to pay a price if you want revenge and you want battle you will have to pay the price and so arjun does win the war but he also loses his son and he loses abhimanyu and draupadi loses her children so it is not to be seen as acha when i read the bhagavad gita i will now know the mantra of making money what you learn in the bhagavad gita is to balance work and life and to know the cost benefit analysis of it's not about oh i have got this magical formula ek like app hai main usko download kar dunga aur usko main dal dunga and then i'll make money because now i know the bhagavad gita what you do learn from the bhagavad gita is in life when you take decisions every decision has a consequence 
And so understand, take the perspective, try to understand what's going on, know that you may not always win. It is okay not to win. And even when you win, you may have paid a price, then you may not have thought of. So all these are the ideas that come in Bhagavad Gita. So it's a, it's a complex book. It's not something that, you know, after reading 18 lessons from the Bhagavad Gita, I will now be charged to make a $100 billion company. That's fair and extremely relevant over there. Uh, okay, I am going to pick up a question from Kesha, who believes that the youth in India are possibly some of us, according to him, some of us are ashamed of our culture, despite the fact that we are civilized and scientific ones. So his question is, how do you bring that pride in our Indian culture? How does he bring, bring pride in our Indian culture amongst his peers and friends? What can he do to spread that word? Make money. Do it the right way? Well, first, make money. I mean, when was the last time you've, got, you've generated wealth? If you don't generate wealth, nobody is going to respect you. You can keep shouting how brilliant you are. Great cultures are the one which generate wealth and create opportunities for people. So great culture is where people, you know, it's like, are you an ecosystem that gets people in or forces people to move out? So when a land is rich, then people migrate, you immigrate to the land. So we say America is a great land. People are immigrating there, emigrating there. You're immigrating out of India to America. So in the same way, if you can reverse that, how will you reverse that when you create opportunities in India? It's as simple as that. So you want people to respect India, create opportunities in India. That's all you have to do. It's not because nobody owes you respect. Nobody owes you respect. Create opportunity and people will respect you. Makes sense. Um, Devdatta, I'm going to take a very light question. There's a green artifact behind you on your, behind your left shoulder. Someone has asked, wants to know the significance of that. And I see a painting on the right side, which is a not, not thing in white. Uh, any significance behind those two? So that is Ram. That is a mask of Ram. So, you know, whenever people talk of Ram, they think of him as this blue image. What they don't realize in South India, in Odisha, in Bengal, in Karnataka, in Mysore, in uh, Kerala, in uh, uh, Tamil Nadu, Ram is always painted green. So we don't know much about our culture. So that's why it's a mask of Ram from Odisha. And this is an, a tantric image of Saraswati, um, which if you look carefully, it is about compounding growth. So if you understand what is wealth compounding growth, you will understand what this means. One leads to two, leads to four, leads to eight, leads to 16, leads to 64. So that's what it is showing. That's not just application to knowledge, but it's also to wealth, but also to knowledge. So knowledge also uh, functions through compounding. Very interesting. And I've always struggled to your Bob and understand art. And I would have struggled to realize that concept from that particular image, but very interesting over there. Uh, Devda, there's a question from Aviral Jain who's asking, according to you, which is one story from Jainism or Ahimsa, which is most relevant to today's business world that you think should be taught at universities or business schools in the country? So any one story from Jainism or Ahimsa that you really find interesting? So uh, the story that I always talk about is about the idea of there is a Vasudev, there is a Chakravarti, and there's a Tirthankara. A Vasudev is focused on what he wants. He focuses on what he wants. He's very focused. But with Chakravarti has a wider perspective of things. He is a, like a manager. He has a slightly 360 degree view of the world. So Chakra, so it's a two dimensional view of the world. But with the Tirthankara, you have a three dimensional view of the world. He sees the world not just from the physical side, but also from a psychological side. So if you want to really succeed in life, you, can, you have to move from a one-dimensional view of the world to a two-dimensional view of the world to the three-dimensional view of the world. And in the third-dimensional view of the world, you will realize it is not your hunger that matters. It is other people's hunger that matters. And that's what Jainism is talking about, where wealth is generated not for yourself, but for the hungry people around you. Very interesting. Uh, 
Devtak, I have this question from Shubham, who's read your book, Seven Secrets of Shiva. Uh, so it, the book explains how Shiva being a hermit also plays the role of a family man. According to him, it is apt in today's scenario where we can make an analogy between the switch from work mode and home mode in the current work from home mo model. So his question is, how does one you know, be in the work mode and the family man's role when we are working from home and quite literally online 24 seven or at least 27, right? Four hours of sleep, rest, we are always checking WhatsApps, emails and all of that. So how does one achieve that balance in life? So you have to ask yourself, uh, whose hunger are you satisfying? So sometimes you're satisfying a customer's hunger. Sometimes you are satisfying an employee's hunger. Sometimes you are satisfying a family's hunger. So you're constantly satisfying people's hunger. And that's a key concept in Indian thought, um, hunger. And um, as a family man, you're constantly satisfying people's hungers. So even at job, you're satisfying people's hunger. You are working because someone out there needs what you have to offer them. It's a different way of thinking. Now that's part of my workshops, right? Which I try to explain that we don't look at work as task completion. We look at work as satisfying people's hunger, like identifying what are the hungers of people and say, I have to satisfy these people's hunger. And that's what work and life is all about. You have different people have to be satisfied at work. Different people have to be satisfied in life. And only when you satisfy those people will they satisfy you. So this is a very famous uh, uh, Yajurved concept, which says, Dehi ma dadami te. Give me what I give you. If I give you satisfaction, you will give me satisfaction. So when you work and give other people satisfaction, they give you satisfaction. But we don't think like that. And therefore, we turn work into this kind of a stressful game that where we have to complete my job and don't find joy in our jobs. That's good advice. That's something which I need to follow as well. Otherwise, we end up stretching ourselves a little too thin at times. Uh, so I'm going to take this question from Nelson, who's got a very interesting perspective over here. He's saying that the Indian culture has a lot of lot in common with the Chinese culture as compared to the North American or the European culture. But in today's geopolitical scenario, right, we are closer. We tend to follow the West more closely rather than aligning with the East as such. So how did we end up over here and what can we do to tackle such geopolitical situations where we are always fighting with our neighbors or our neighbors are fighting with us, whatever scenario you look at that. How do we handle these situations better? So we have unfortunately become rather combative and we have, it's a colonial legacy that looks at neighbors with hostility rather than as trading partners. And uh, we never looked at our neighbors as trading partners. We have always looked upon them uh, and we therefore we did not work an ecosystem where there is a mutual favorable balance of trade with each other. I help you become rich and you help me become rich for whatever ego reasons, whatever reasons we want to call it. We created battlegrounds everywhere and that's never been healthy. If you look at the Harappa civilization it thrived because it had excellent business relations with uh, its neighbors. The Harappa civilization for 700 years did not have an army. Nobody teaches us this. 700 years, a culture without an army. How did it survive? And obviously through trade, it is about trading people. So we don't learn these things. We don't, like for example, the Chinese, they have closed themselves off. They are a culture which is famous for its walls. They always have walls and they are very suspicious of people beyond the walls. They look at people outside the wall as barbarians. And uh, they've always had this, this is the mindset they've always had. Now, when you deal with them, you have to deal with them differently. They talk different language. Uh, they use the language of the wall. You know, they had the Great Wall of China. Then now they have the Great Firewall. 500 years ago, there were 4,000 cities in China that, was, that had walled cities. We have never had such walled cities ever. We follow a very different model in India. So we have not understood China. We have not figured out how to work with them, how they are highly militaristic, how they are very centrally controlled. Um, we don't, we are not centrally controlled. We don't like that kind of centralization, which is there in China. We despise that. We are a relatively independent minded people. We do not like central control the way China likes. So we have a lot of freedom in our country that we don't realize is not there in China. So in China, yes, you get a lot of prosperity. You don't get a lot of freedom. In India, you get a lot of freedom, but unfortunately not so much prosperity. And therefore the balancing act happens. We have something to offer them and they have something to offer us. And we have to figure out slowly, very slowly, not just by eating momos and noodles, but something more. 
And I think there's lots in Chinese culture to learn. And I think when we show curiosity and respect for them, they will show curiosity and respect for us. And that's step one of Samvad and then work on the trade. We still have good trade relations with them. Nobody can survive in today's world without having good trade relations with China. That's fair. Um, so Devdath, I'm gonna take a difficult question, a question which I'm difficult, finding difficult to articulate over here. So Kostub is asking, is saying that uh, you spoke about Ahinsa Parmo Dharma, but there's an addition to it on Dharma Hinsa Tathewa Che. Sure, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing Doesn't matter. it. Correctly. You okay. see, these, uh, the fact is, if you want to kill people, go ahead, kill. You don't need my permission or a scriptural permission because it is your animal instinct. Animals kill to eat. And we can choose to be animals and say that, you know what? I want to be like an animal and I want to kill to eat. Because violence is natural, right? Animals kill to eat. They fight uh, for territory. They fight, animals fight over territory. They fight for prey. Um, they fight rivals. So that violence is natural. You can't get rid of it. To withdraw from violence is what makes us human. So it's up to you completely. You have a complete right to be violent and indulge your animal instinct. Or you can say that, you know what, I can make a lot of money and be very successful without getting into a fight. I choose the latter. That's a great perspective. At this point, I'm also going to invite Narottam to join us again. Uh, Narottam, if you're still here, can you please turn on the video and join us for a Q&A? I actually have a question for you. Okay, great. He is here. Just allow me a second to spotlight you as well. So the audience would be able to see you clearly as well. Okay, great. You are here. So Narutam, there was a question from the audience, from someone in the audience asking how is Bitsom bringing this whole cultural perspective into the classroom during the MBA program? And I know you do have a coursework on winning at workplace. Can you please tell the audience a little more about that? and talk about how Bitsom brings in such learnings from the uh, from mythology, from the culture into the MBA program at Bitsom. Yeah, so <clears throat> Devda did say in the beginning of the session about art uh, in the curriculum uh, or like STEAM becoming, uh, STEM becoming STEAM. And that's what uh, Bitsom is focusing, bringing a liberal art education in our curriculum. So we believe that you not only need to learn the core business knowledge, you also need to learn those liberal arts courses because that helps you develop those empathy or emotional skills or social skills. And that's a good component of uh, uh, those liberal art courses as part of curriculum. So we call it a winning at the workplace courses. So there's one core courses which is focused towards your business knowledge. And then there's a second type of courses which we call it winning at the workplaces courses. Uh, that, that's focused on developing your, uh, or bringing your liberal education. And that's what we try to inculcate those knowledge, those uh, skill sets to our students. And that's an important component of our curriculum. So the amount of effort that you put in for business courses, the same amount of effort you put in for those winning at the workplace courses. And we believe that by bringing these two kinds of courses, we are able to produce talent which are, which are able to you know, succeed uh, once they graduate into school and move to corporate work. All right, that's very interesting. And Dave, that one question over here, uh, there's a lot of focus on ethics during it or increasing focus on ethics in an MBA program. But in, despite of that, we have seen a lot of cases of immoral behavior from top executives, top business leaders in the world. And uh, even your people who have studied at top institutions and taken such courses in ethics, sometimes they end up showing uh, unethical behavior as well at the workplace what kind of learning that can these schools bring into the classroom curriculum or what can they focus on to improve their track record, improve the track record of their alums on the do in the domain of ethics? I think it comes down to how much, how do you respect, do you respect other people? And I think ethics is, people try to make it very complicated. It's just about respecting people. Do you respect people you work with? Do you respect your investors? Do you respect your customers? Do you respect the environment? Do you respect the government? Uh, do you respect uh, uh, the regulatory body? So it's about respect. Or do you not respect them? You don't care for them. Uh, you feel they are just tools, in obstacles in your path of growth. 
and uh, you know that's the whole point you know many a times we use words like all is fair in love and war and you know once you use these words uh, you know in bollywood movies show stalkers as lovers and nobody questions that like the men who chase women are somehow romantic people they are really creepy monsters but nobody is listening to the women and therefore you disrespect this disrespect is a key word um, so i think it's about what stops you from being respectful of others i think that's the conversation that people need to have uh, what, are you so desperate that you're willing to disrespect other people and where is this desperation coming from i think these are private personal conversations that we need to have people make mistakes but we can always unfortunately we don't give room for people to uh, make mistakes you know sort it out we tend to be very judgmental in these matters but i think a more feminine maternal approach where you sort of uh, gently admonish people and we tell them to you know not cross the line catch it early before it crosses the line rather than wait till a disaster strikes uh, when it becomes difficult to manage and can become very serious to the organization so i think these things have to be handled at an early stage and if you have a organization that is more creating an ecosystem of trust and an ecosystem of respect uh, i think uh, ethical issues can be resolved fairly easily it doesn't have to be a school masterly approach take that one question from professor pankaj gupta who is attending the session as well and he is asking if meditation mindfulness yog nidra these should be made part of a made a mandatory part of an mba curriculum or a education system so that people live in a more harmonious way uh, get a restful mind and focus on things which are more productive uh, but on the other hand these schools are focused on pushing the students towards doing their best you know loading them with a lot of assignments group work and everything so how do schools bring in that balance in perspective you know your body has to be managed so you know it as you grow older more young people don't think so much about these things but diet is important sleep is important exercise is important now physical exercise you go to the gym but for mental exercise you need to do meditation mindfulness whatever you can do whatever you want because based on your whatever works for you but you need to have a system whereby you exercise your mind you exercise your body you have good sleep and you eat nutritious food i think if you don't do this it's quite possible that you know your brain won't work and you may not be able to get the uh, right uh, you know uh, answers in the exam you might just doze off or because you have brain fog you will not give the right answer so i think uh, you need all of this little bits of it and you have to map, park it but that's you know that can be given to people but it's very difficult to implement you can make people aware of it uh with, and tell them that these are the options because without your body um you are nothing you know steve jobs is dead it's finished khatam gaya and uh you know ultimately the one thing that we have and we must take care of is our body and as long as we have our body we will enjoy the success no no body no success okay so did that one question over here and i'm going to make this question up myself your top 3 recommendations in books that the audience should read and these could of course be your books as well but other authors as well if you recommend any so right now i would recommend a book called the dawn of everything by david bengro it's and uh, that's a very good book then there's debt the history of debt uh, by um, david greba david greba so there's debt there's dawn of everything and if you want to read one of my books then pick up business sutra or leader great i'm also posting this in the chat window so that the audience can pick it up the three book names the recommendations are there and i know that you do a very popular show on the radio uh do you still do that it keeps I coming keep repeating it so i just do okay. this seasons and they keep coming so okay so any timing or anything when the audience can catch it on and on the channel you can go to my it. website devdad.com and they'll get access okay. to all the videos articles they don't have to buy anything they can just read up and they'll have access to all the videos the ted talks it's about free access to about 2000 articles so wow that is a lot of insightful content right there great so to the audience we are in the last 5 minutes of the session we are running 
over time and i see a lot of still open questions my apologies i can't pick up all the questions to ask in this particular session we are running a little over time but i'm going to pick last two questions to ask so if you have any questions that you really really want an answer to post them in the q and a box right now and i'll pick the top two from there in the meanwhile i'm going to pick up a question from abhishek mittal who is asking for your thoughts on the nine unknown men world's most powerful secret society founded by morya emperor ashoka are you aware of this society are you aware of this no, no, uh, that's a work of fiction and that's a work of fiction it's a very good work of fiction but please don't get carried away by works of fiction okay so deep that the question over here so mythology again it's believed that you know there's no proof of those things happening right you know we don't really have proof of maybe the rama and the you know the uh so we don't really have proofs of a lot of these mythological stories so how do you differentiate between fact and fiction over here so uh fact is everybody's truth fiction is nobody's truth myth is somebody's truth so when you talk to people and they say that i believe in god and you don't believe in god you have two choices you can have a violent argument with them and say that you are wrong and i'm right or you can have a samvad with them and say that you know what i respect your truth Uh, that your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and let's have a samvad let's have a conversation which is the basis of ahimsa management respect other people's truths and you will make friends and when you make friends you will make good business partners that will make you a lot of money very interesting over there and uh, okay now we are getting into a completely different a territory of revenge so harshit's point is that was the revenge by the pandavas justified and is revenge how do you let go right i mean if someone's wrong to you how do you let go and become so magnanimous to forgive that you know those people and not take revenge so i think there are underlying there's underlying question over there how does one become so selfless to let go and not take revenge that is why the jains are the most successful business community in the world you know the jewish people there was an entire holocaust and anti semitism where the jewish people are hated nobody hates the jain community because they learned to forgive you have a choice of learning from the very very rich traditions of the jains the tirthankaras who were very successful businessmen who gave away everything by giving away everything it means even giving away anger rage and hisab kitab it is writing off loans if you want to genuinely be successful you should know how to write off loans that's the trick of life or you can be a petty man and say mad revenge le lunga that will make a bollywood film about you but you will not be a zillionaire so i'm going to frame this question myself so we are seeing a lot of indian leaders emerging as ceos of global companies right we have satya nadella uh, we have so many we had indra nuvi we had so many indians leading global companies uh, you know who are currently leading indian uh, global companies leading business schools as well they are deans of global business schools as well so do you expect do you foresee a change in the global work culture over the next couple of decades or is it even possible to move away from that money making mentality to a win win situation kind of mentality which you are talking about do you see that change coming into the business world over the next couple of decades see you always have to make money that's non negotiable the question is do you share it with others that's a different conversation there is you you can't stop not making money the question in this world today is how do you share it with others how do you reinvest it in the larger society or do you just store it for yourself so that's the question it's a very simple question it's not about making money making money is not negotiable you have to make money the question is how do you distribute the money do you share it how do you reinvest it in the market how do you make other societies prosperous because if you don't make other people prosperous they will attack you and steal your money that's how thieves emerge that's how barbarians are at the gate because learn from the harappa civilization 700 years without an army because they had good trading relations with everybody around them everybody fought the egyptians fought the mesopotamians fought harappans never fought they were busy trading with everyone for 700 years that's an achievement that nobody talks about and it's not part of our history books can you believe that 
In fact, I know scholars are trying very hard to prove that Harappans were actually violent. And I'm like, oh my God, you're all like obsessed with violence. Fair. Uh, on that note, we are sharp on time. It's 8.15. So I'm going to ask for parting advice from both of you. Uh, Dev, why don't you go first? Any advice to the audience? The audience is in that really young age group, so 18 to 22 year olds, most of them. Uh, your top three advices for them? If, you know, a, a king is only successful when he has the Navratnas to ask the question of those nine secrets. If you don't have a team, you will never be a great king. So always remember this, a king is only successful because he has Navratna. So you may be brilliant, but if you can't work with nine other people in your team, chance of success are slim. Fair. But we do see this alpha male kind of culture in a lot of companies and you know, we see initial wins going their way, right? The more aggressive, the more outspoken, the more pushy is able to show results and grow faster, at least in the initial stages of their career. So how does, how does our audience still remain competitive, still continue on that path of lead, future leadership without becoming that alpha male or that really pushy character in the company? For that, they have to attend my course. Perfect advice. That's perfect advice. I think Narottam really, as the head of admissions at Bitsum, really likes that point. <laughs> Narottam, your advice to the audience. A lot of them may be looking to apply to Bitsum. Any advice or any parting words to them? Sure. Thanks, Sanjay. So my advice, I would say from my experience, when I did my MBA from ISB and the kind of faculty I was exposed to, that was one of the life-changing moments that I had. I the kind of exposure that I got, the kind of learning that I got uh, truly totally transformed me in terms of my learning, in terms of my curiosity, in terms of my perspective. And I can assure you, I can assure you that Bitsom is, is in the similar line. With the kind of faculty that you are bringing, you will get exposed to top class learning and that will transform you and make you become a better person. So if you are curious about knowledge, if you're curious about becoming a better learner or trying to become a better person, and Bitsum offers you that kind of curriculum. Bitsum offers you that kind of you know, exposure that will truly transform your life. So feel free reaching out to us. Uh, we will be happy to connect with you. If you have any queries, reach out to us and one of our admission team members will be having conversation with you and help you how you can submit a strong application and be a part of next cohort, which is starting in July 2022. And study with faculty like Mr. Devdat Patak during the course as well. And Narutam Jan 30 is the next deadline. Jan 30 is our next deadline, which is coming up after two weeks. Yes. Awesome. And there's going to be a round three as well. There will be a round sometime three. in March. Yes. Okay. Great. So thank you to both of you. Thank you, Mr. Patnag. Thank you for taking out the time to do this session. We touched a high of around 870 people in the audience. I think that's a new record that we have created so far. So thank you for doing this session. Uh, from the audience comments, I am quite confident that they found the session extremely insightful, extremely useful and possibly taken some life-changing tips and guidance from this particular session. Thank you to you as well, Narutam, for facilitating this, for getting Mr. Patnag to do this session for us. So thank you for doing that. To the audience, thank you to you as well. Uh, it's really, it was really great to see your enthusiasm and read your, take your questions uh, for Mr. Patnag and Narutam from, this, you know, for, from the Q&A. My apologies, I couldn't pick up all the questions that came in. There were just too many of those and we were running out of time. But thank you for being here. Do take care of all of you. And if you are, as Narutam mentioned, if you are looking to study from faculty like Mr. Patnayak, then you know what to do. The Bitsome next deadline is Jan 30. So look forward to that. If not, then not the Jan 30 deadline, there's going to be another deadline in March. So look forward to that. And hopefully you would be a student at Bitsome and get to study with other stalwarts and people like Mr. Patnayak. So thank you again to both of you and to the audience for doing this session. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting all of you. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Have a good night, man. Thank you very much.